All right, good morning and welcome to our Sunday School Hour this morning. Good to see, uh, good to see each one of you here and uh, appreciate you being here early and, and uh, being able to join with us in the time of singing and now looking into God's Word together. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Psalms. And uh, Psalm 59 is where we're going to focus our attention this morning. Uh, Psalm number 59. Uh, many times you will find people who will spend a lot of money to buy a dog uh, because they want a friend. Uh, maybe nobody likes them on Facebook, so they buy a dog. I don't know. But anyway, they'll spend a lot of money and they want to they wanna buy a dog. But some people will actually spend a money, uh, spend a lot of money to buy a dog that they want to use for protection. We call it a guard dog or, 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 or a watch dog. And so they'll, they'll get this dog and uh, usually it's, uh, it's uh, hopefully very well trained and they'll, and they'll let that dog basically uh, during the night while they're sleeping or, or maybe if they're away, they'll let that dog have the roam of their house and that dog will go around uh, just, to, just, to keep, just to keep things safe and to scare away the burglars. Hopefully it will not be like a dog that when Ginger and I were first married, we lived in Springfield, Missouri, and, uh, and, and there was actually an article in the paper about this family who had a big German shepherd. And, and this German shepherd was their watchdog. And so uh, they had the sign, they had the sign posted on their house, beware of the dogs, you know. And, and, and so they, they had this German shepherd, and, and true enough, they're gone, and this guy breaks into their house. He comes through the window, and as he comes through the window, he sees this German shepherd just laying there, and the German shepherd doesn't move. He didn't bark. He didn't growl. He didn't do anything. He just laid there. So the guy very, you know, he's, he comes on into the house. He goes around, one eye on the dog, you know, but he goes around collecting things that he wants to steal. And still the dog did not move until the guy tried to leave. And the dog wouldn't let him leave. And the guy ended up, according to the newspaper, the guy ended up calling the police, asking the police to come help him get out of that house. <laughs> now that's a good watchdog, okay? That's a good watchdog. Now the reason I mention that is because King Saul, King Saul had some watchdogs. He had some guard dogs. The, the, these were men, these were men in his court who were expected to, to protect him. To protect him from all enemies, whether they were real or imagined. Uh, it was the job of these men to, to protect, to protect King Saul. And as we've seen in our study together through this book, uh, David, in, in the court of King Saul, David was, he was one of King Saul's most loyal subjects. One of King Saul's most loyal subjects, and yet he was the one that King Saul feared the most. King Saul feared him. King Saul despised him. And, and, and the reason is found in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 12. The Bible says that Saul was afraid of David. Here's the reason why. Because the Lord was with him. King Saul hated him for that. God's wisdom, God's power was evidenced in the life of David and it drove King Saul mad that, that, that the Lord was with him and at the same time, the Lord had departed from Saul. Departed from Saul. And so King Saul turns his watchdogs loose on David. He turns his watchdogs loose on David. A clear example of this is found in the biblical record. You'll remember Saul in, in a jealous rage uh, one day picked up a javelin and, and literally tried to, tried to pin David to the wall with a javelin. Tried to kill him. Tried to end his life right there. But you remember David, David was, was able to escape. He was able to slip away. And so therefore the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 19 verse 11 that Saul sent messengers. You might want to put in the, in the side note or in the margin there, uh, these are his watchdogs, okay? He, he sent messengers unto David's house to watch him. 
He sends messengers to watch him, to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. And so during the night, while those watchdogs of King Saul sat around the house, they're, they're, they're waiting for the morning to come so that they can catch him as he comes out of his house to go to the office. They're, they're waiting there and, and they're going to slip up on him. They're going to take his life. They're going to kill him. They'll try to make it look like a burglary gone wrong. Uh, he was mugged, you know, by some, some stranger. But at any rate, they're going to, they, they've got some scheme. They're, they're going to do away. They're going to do away with David. And I think it's during that time. Perhaps even that very night, David wrote the psalm that we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, let, let's begin by noticing this morning. Notice the title. It's to the chief musician, Altashif, Mitchdom of David, when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill him. That, that, that's the title that is given to the psalm. Notice we find several things in this title. First of all, there is the, the address E. It's to the chief singer. It's to the leader of the music, leader of the orchestra that would play in the, in the tabernacle or in the temple during their, during their worship services. That's who this is addressed to. It's to the chief musician. And then we find there is the theme that is mentioned. And it is out to shift. And, and, and we've seen this word before in the, in the last two Psalms, if you'll remember. And, and you'll remember it means destroy not. It means destroy not. In other words, just as David had refused to take matters into his own hands when dealing with King Saul back in Psalm 57, and just as David had refused to take matters into his own hands when dealing with those unjust judges that we saw last week in Psalm 58, in the very same way David is determined that he's going to trust in the Lord God He's going to trust in the Lord God's deliverance from these wicked watchdogs, these vicious watchdogs that would seek to take his life. They're, they're hounding him, they're chasing him, just waiting for an opportunity to destroy him. And, and, and David says in all of that, I'm not going to take matters in my own hands. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. And so that's the theme. Notice the purpose of this, number three. There is the purpose, the purpose. And again, this is a mitchdom psalm, you'll notice. It's a mitchdom. And again, we've seen this same thing over the past couple of weeks. And you remember the word mitchdom. It simply means to engrave, to engrave. In other words, the idea is that this psalm is going to contain some wonderful truths. There, there's some wonderful truths in this psalm that ought to be engraved in the heart and in the mind of every believer in Jesus Christ. This is something that needs to be engraved into our thinking. These are truths that must not be forgotten. These are truths that will keep us from trying to take matters into our own hands when we are attacked. This will help us not to take matters into our own hands when we are troubled by those enemies who would seek to come after us. Because remember what we saw last time? The wrath of a man cannot work the righteousness of God. It, it, it cannot happen. And so we need to learn these things. They need to be engraved in our mind. The writer, number four. Of course, the writer is David, as we have seen identified in the title. And then the occasion. It's during that period of time that we have just mentioned when Saul's watchdogs are watching his house, waiting for an opportunity to take his life. And so with that as an introduction, let's now turn to the text and let's notice two key points that we find in the two paragraphs that are contained in this psalm. David is going to talk about two things. Two things that he's going to speak of. First of all, we find, number one, David's danger. There is David's danger. And certainly David was no stranger to danger. Hey, that rhymes. I, I, I should be a poet. Yeah, he, he's no stranger to danger, right? I mean, you remember even as a teenager when he is out uh, watching his father's sheep, you remember there was that time when, when, when there, was a, there was a lion that came along. 
Uh, and then a bear came along. Uh, and, and each one of them tried to steal one of the sheep. And, uh, and David, being a good, diligent shepherd, uh, he didn't try to run away. Uh, he, he faced those predators and, and actually killed them uh, and, and, and delivered the sheep that would have been killed by them. Uh, you also remember there was that time when he faced that Philistine giant. And, 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 and there God gave to him that great victory. So he's no stranger uh, to danger. He, he's been in dangerous situations before. But the difference is, is that those dangers, the lion, the bear, the Philistine, all, all of those dangers were very straightforward. They're, they're straightforward dangers. In, in, in other words, they're very clear. They, you, you can see where the danger is. But the dangers that he's facing now, it's, it's something different. It's something different. Notice with me a couple of things. First of all, there is his plea. His plea. In verse 1 and verse number 2, David says, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. The word, or the phrase bloody men simply means men who are intent on shedding blood. These are men who are intent on, on doing murder. That, that, that's, who he's, that's who he's addressing. That's who is in his mind here as he prays and asks that God would deliver him from these wicked men who are seeking to shed his blood. That's his plea. Lotus letter B. We see his panic. We see his panic. In, in, in verse number three, he continues. He says, For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me. Now the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I cannot help but think that that night as David is getting ready for bed, he looks out the window of his house and, and perhaps he can see, perhaps he can see those men kind of lurking around in the shadows outside his house. He, he can see them out there. They're kind of, they're trying to hide themselves, trying to disguise themselves. And, and perhaps he was able to see those watchdogs that King Saul had sent to surround his house to watch his house. He, he just escaped from the javelin, right? He just escaped from the javelin, and so he's pretty convinced that these men are up to no good. The, these men are up to no good. These men are not here to wish him well. They are here to do him bodily harm. And certainly, certainly, he would have naturally felt the same fears that you and I would feel if we were in that situation, he would have naturally felt those same matters of concern. And, and there, were, there were three things, though, that as he considered his situation, he felt that natural panic, that natural fear rising up in him. There were, there were three things that kind of, kind of tempered the panic so that it did not overwhelm him. Three things that tempered his panic. Number one, his innocence. His innocence. Uh, in verse 3, in verse number 4, David says, They lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me. Now notice it. Not for my transgression. Not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. In, in other words, I haven't done anything wrong. I have not broken any laws. I, I've not committed anything that would cause King Saul to, to mistrust me. I've been diligent. I've been faithful. I've been loyal. I haven't done anything that was wrong. And yet they run and prepare themselves without my fault. I, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not at fault. And yet they are they're running after me. They're preparing themselves for my destruction. It's interesting to notice how the wicked are said to run and prepare themselves to do wickedness. They run and prepare themselves to do wickedness. I, I, I agree with a fellow by the name of William Plummer. He, he died in 1880. Uh, that was a little bit before my time. But, but uh, William Plummer, he wrote, here's, here's what he said. He said this, whoops, sorry. He said this, he said, the zeal and diligence of the wicked 
in the cause of unrighteousness might well reprove the languor and tardiness of saints in the work of faith and the labor of love. In other words, what Plummer is saying is simply this. Isn't it sad that so many times the wicked are more diligent in their service to Satan than you and I are in our diligence to serving the true and the living God? Yeah, that's exactly what David has in mind. They, they run and prepare themselves to do wickedness. How sad it is and how ashamed we ought to be when the devil's crowd is more zealous, more zealous, and, and they're more devoted to damning the souls of men than we are to reaching the souls of men for Jesus Christ. But in spite of all their rushing, in spite of all their preparing to do him dark harm, David is confident. He's confident that he's done nothing to deserve any of this. He, he is absolutely innocent of any wrongdoing. He's, he's innocent of any fault. He hasn't done anything. And he's confident that these men are, are, are basically doing this not because he has done wrong, but simply because this is what they were commanded to do. And because of his confidence and the fact of his innocence, we then see his boldness, number two. We see his boldness. Awake to help me. Who's he talking to? Well, he's talking to God. He's talking to the Lord God. And, and, and so his, his, his boldness now is, is to come and say, Lord God, Lord, Lord God, wake up. You don't ever sleep. You don't ever slumber. But sometimes I feel like maybe your eye is not on me. I want you to wake up. I want you to pay attention. I want, you to, I want you to deliver me from these unjust enemies who are seeking my harm, even though I'm totally innocent, and yet they seek my destruction. But then David saw that the dangerous problems that he faced, the dangerous problems that he faced, these problems are, are not unique for him. These problems are not unique for him. He understood, he understood that God's people in every place, in every time, including today at HBC, okay? People in every place, people in every time, they face these same kind of issues. They face these same kind of problems. And so David expands his prayer. He expands his prayer. He wants God to wake up and pay attention to him, but, but he doesn't stop with that. Thou therefore, verse number 5, Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit who? All the heathen. All the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. In other words, this isn't a prayer just about himself being delivered from wicked men. His prayer is that all of Israel might be delivered from such wicked and ungodly men. And then he speaks of number three, or letter C, he speaks of his peril. In verse number six, here's what he says. They return... They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog. In other words, they're snarling and growling at him. They, 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 they make a noise like a dog and they go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? Did, 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 did you catch what he just said there? Did, did you catch what he just said? You see, not only, not only were those watchdogs made brave by the fact that they're following the orders of the king, they are emboldened by their self-deception that nobody will ever know, that nobody will ever find out, that nobody will ever discover their wicked deeds. They say, who's going to hear about it? What we're going to do, who's going to ever discover it? 
Who will ever know? Who will ever find out? By the way, that's the lie that Satan feeds to every person with every temptation to sin. Oh yeah, the Satan will say, oh yeah, I know, I know the Bible says be sure your sin will find you out, but hey, you know what? You're so clever. You're so smart. You, you can sin against God. You can rebel against God. You can do what you want to do. And, and guess, nobody will ever know. Let me just remind you, Jesus said that Satan is a liar. And he's the father of all lies. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. The, these men, they, they, they believe. They believe that somehow they can sin. They can do this terribly evil thing. And they're snarling, they're growling, they're threats against David. They can do all, not only that, they can even carry through and nobody, nobody will ever know. And so David spoke of his danger. Spoke of his danger. But he also spoke, notice number two. We find his deliverance. His deliverance. Now the Bible doesn't say this. But, but I sort of think that as David was praying, the Lord God gave him one of those light bulb minutes. Do you know what I mean by that when I say a light bulb minute? It's like he's praying and all of a sudden the light turns on. Bing! And he has this idea. He has this, he has this idea. And, and his idea, his idea, and you can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse, down, verse 11 down to verse number 17. His idea is, is that uh, he, he gets up after he says amen at the end of his prayer. And, and then he gets up and he calls his wife in. And he says, God gave me this idea. Here, here, here's what I want us to do. And, and so he shares, he shares his plan with her. And the plan is simply this, that, that she is going to, she's going to let David down from a back window. And, and she's going to take a rope and she's going to hang it out the back window and David is going to be able to escape. He's going to be able to go out the back window where, where nobody's watching, nobody is looking there. And, 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 so, and so he'll be able to escape out of the house. And, and then just to make it more believable, she'll, she'll get some pillows and, and get some cushions and she'll put them under the covers in the bed and then pull the cover up over all of that so that it will look like that he's still in the bed. And then she will come up with the story, well, David didn't go to work today because he's sick. He's still in the bed upstairs. And so this is the plan. This is the plan. And so when David does not appear the next morning, she, she tells the story. But, but of course, even though that bought David some time, the watchdogs didn't really fall for it. Even though he thought it would certainly be silly of them. It would be silly for them to, to, to appear and, 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 and then once the truth is discovered, how that their faces would turn red with embarrassment and, and, and all of that. But David says this in verse number 8. He says, But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Notice it's not men laughing. It's not men who are laughing at their foolishness. It's God. God will laugh at them. And thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Men think themselves, as I mentioned a moment ago, to be so clever when it comes to planning their, their sinful actions. When it comes to planning how they're going to sin against God and they think themselves so clever that somehow they're going to be able to escape. They're going to be able to go without being found out. And let me just tell you that when wicked men start thinking such wicked thoughts, God in heaven laughs. Not the hilarious laugh of a, like we have it a good joke, but it's the laugh of like, <laughs> how, can they, how can they be so deceived? That kind of a laugh. The, the laugh of a sorrowful, sorrowful kind of a laugh, if I can put it that way. That the God of heaven just laughs at their foolish stupidity that allows them to be so deceived to think that they can actually do evil and get away with it. 
So David, David says this, because of his strength, talking about God's strength, will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. It's not what I can do to save myself. It's what God will do to save me. That's what David is looking for. God is my defense. And then David, he spoke of three things. He spoke, first of all, of his protection. In verse number 10, he says this, The God of my mercy shall prevent me. Now, the word prevent there, you understand, is, is actually, it's an old English word that we, we don't use it this way today. Uh, today, when we say something prevented me, that means it hindered me. But, but in the old English, it simply means to go before. And so what David is saying here is simply this. He says, the God of my mercy shall go before me. That's, that's what he's saying. He's going to go before me. God shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. In, in, in other words, the desire of my heart that I will be delivered from these wicked, evil men. God is going to let me, he's going to let me realize that desire. He's going to let me see my prayer answered, if we can put it that way. He's going to let me see my prayer answered. He's going to go before me. He's going to give me victory. That's His protection. But then also notice we see His petition. His petition. And David is going to petition the high court of heaven for two things. He's going to petition the high court of heaven for two things. First of all, he's going to petition God for judgment. He's going to petition God for judgment. I, I've read that the Spartans, if, you, if you're familiar with, with that period of, uh, of medieval history, the, the old Spartans uh, refused to allow the destruction of a neighboring city. They, they refused to allow the destruction of that neighboring city that had oftentimes started wars with them. Many times that neighboring city would attack them and, and, and start, try to start a war with them. And, and of course the Spartans would defeat them, but they never destroyed them. And the reason why they never destroyed them, this is what they said. They said, destroy not the whetstone of our young men. In other words, we don't want to destroy this city because this city is where our young men are going to learn how to fight. This is where our young men are going to learn how to do battle. This is how they will learn how to, how to handle different situations when in a state of war. In other words, those ancient Spartans wanted their enemies to live so that the young Spartans might learn the art of war. And that's the thing we find in our text. It's interesting. It's exactly what David says. Notice it in verse number 11. Slay them not. Talking about his enemies. And he's asking God, don't kill them. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield. You, you see, David did not simply want his enemies to be killed. David wanted his enemies to be humbled. He wanted his enemies to be humbled. He wanted, he wanted them to, to be driven from the courts of power. He, he wanted them to be brought down in a way that would actually be an encouragement to the people of God. And the reason why those enemies would deserve such humbling, he reiterates it for us in verse number 12. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips. In other words, because of their arrogant boasting, let them be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. He brings his prayer. He brings his prayer to the high court of heaven. He's asking, he's asking for, for judgment. Asking for judgment. But there's another thing that he's asking for, and that is this. He's asking for justice. He's asking for justice. You, you see, not only did David want God's people to learn from the judgments of God against his enemies, David wanted his enemies to know where their judgment was coming from. 
He, he wants His enemies to know that they are under the chastening hand of the Lord God. That, that this isn't Him that's creating their problems. It's God who is bringing justice upon them. And so therefore, He says in verse number 13, consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know, let them know that God ruleth in Jacob. By the way, when you find the name Jacob there after the book of Genesis, the name Jacob is used to refer to the sons of Jacob, which were the twelve tribes of Israel. This is another name for Israel. And, and so he says, let them, let, let them know that God is ruling in Israel. Hey, and that's not the end of it. He's ruling in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Unto the ends of the earth. Again, the idea is not that David wants to see his enemies killed. That's not the idea. You see, the word consume means to bring to an end. In other words, David's desire was that even his enemies might learn that it is the Lord God who rules over the nations of the world. He wants his enemies to learn it's the Lord God who allows men to have and to hold positions of power. You remember what the Bible says? The powers that be are ordained by God. You remember Daniel said he raises up kings, he takes down kings. That's exactly exactly what David wants his enemies to learn. That it is the Lord God who allows men to have positions of power. But he also wants them to understand that the same Lord God who rules over the nations, the same Lord God who allows men to have positions of power, that same Lord God is going to hold them accountable. He will hold them accountable. And so therefore, he ends this verse with the word selah, which simply means think about that. Consider that. Sing that line again. Sing that line again. And so therefore, David desired that his enemies might be humbled under the mighty hand of God. And the fullness of that humiliation, it's seen in verse number 14, and at evening let them return and let them make a noise like a dog. Remember, these are watchdogs, right? So David says, let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. It's the same thing we saw back in verse number 6. But the next verse, the next verse puts a new light on this thing. You see, instead of going around the city in power, instead of strutting around the city with their robes of authority, with their pompous attitudes and their, and their proud hearts, instead of, instead of going around the city in that way, notice David now says in verse number 15, let them wander up and down for meat. In other words, the idea here, David is saying, uh, let, let, these, let these men be like dogs who run in packs going through the garbage that is out in the streets looking for scraps of food that they can eat. Let, 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 let them be like that. Instead of their pride and their arrogance, let them be like a pack of dogs that are just digging in the scraps looking for a morsel that they might be able to eat. Let them wander up and down for meat and and grudge and grudge you ever watch the national geographic channel and you see those those african dogs you know they run in packs and finally they they they're they're able to bring down uh, some prey they're able to bring down uh, some animal and, and and they begin to feed on that animal and and, and, and but, but have you ever noticed that as they're feeding they're constantly <laughs> And they're snarling and they're growling and they're snapping at one another, trying to protect their little morsel. And yeah, that's, that's what David has in mind. Let, let them be like that. Let them be like a pack of dogs running around in the street looking for scraps. Let them be, let them be snapping and snarling at one another, trying, trying to get... If they be not satisfied, let, let, let them be like that. Let them be like that. David's petition was that those wicked, arrogant men who are hounding him, that they might be humbled. They might be humbled in the eyes of the nation. 
not only humbled in the eyes of the nation, but humbled in their own eyes as well. Humbled in their own eyes as well. But until that day came, until that day came, until the day came when God answered his prayer, and God saw, or David saw God doing these things in the lives of his enemies, until that day came, David made a determination. He made a determination. I haven't seen the answer yet, but he's already made a determination. And the determination is simply this. That until the day comes, even though I haven't seen the fulfillment of it yet, my determination is, I'm going to praise. I'm going to praise. You see, instead of focusing on the power of his enemies, David determined he's going to focus on the power of God. Instead of focusing on the power of those who are seeking to destroy Him, He's going to focus on that great shepherd, the Lord Jesus, the God of glory. His, that's going to be His focus. And so He says in verse number 16, verse number 17, but I, but I, 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 I haven't seen this yet. I, I'm praying for justice. I'm praying for judgment. Haven't seen it yet, but I will sing. I'm determined. I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. I'm determined. He hasn't seen the answer yet. But I know who my God is. And I know what my God can do. And so I'm going to praise Him. Before the answer even comes, I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to sing aloud of His mercies. Of how He has blessed me in the past, giving me full confidence He's going to do the same thing in my future. Because He's never failed me in the past. And failure is not in God's dictionary. He will do what He has promised to do. Now, I don't know. I don't know what watchdogs are hounding you today. I, I, I don't know what hounds are after you, what hounds are perhaps filling your heart with fear. But if you will, if you'll keep your heart clean and pure before God, if you will maintain your way before Him, if you'll keep your heart clean and pure, if you will determine that, you know, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands, I'm going to trust God. I'm just going to trust the Lord. And I'm just going to turn all these enemies, whether they're people or circumstances or whatever it may be, I'm just going to turn all of it over to the Lord. I'm going to put it in His hand. I'm going to put it in His hand. If you'll do that, God will certainly deliver you in His time, in His way, and He'll give to you a victory that will truly bring great joy and rejoicing to your heart, but more importantly, He'll give to you a victory that will bring honor and glory to His name. And that's the important thing. And that's the thing that we ought to desire more than anything else that our God will be glorified in everything that relates to our life and to our existence on this earth. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. We pray that You would take these few thoughts and Lord, I pray that You would help us when we face the difficult times. We face those enemies who would come after us, enemies that would seek to, to discourage or to destroy us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember the teaching that David has given in this wonderful psalm. Lord, may these things be engraved in our hearts and in our minds, and may we not forget them. Instead of trying to take matters into our own hands, may we, may we humbly put everything into your hand and trust you to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the great victory that we need, the great victory that we desire in order that Your name 
might be honored and glorified by us, by those who know us, and by all of those who will ever hear our testimony of how you have worked in our heart and in our life. We pray that you would dismiss us now from this hour, blessing the hour that is to follow. May your will be done in each of our hearts and in each of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.